Okay, guys, we'll, we'll make a start. So we're going to start looking at uh, extracting metals uh, in a bit more detail and how the position on the reactivity series dictates the method for that metal's extraction. So just a little start to get you, uh, to get you thinking about metals in general. Uh, can you name one metal that is usually a liquid? Hopefully you guys are all thinking about mercury, uh, which is um, one of only two liquids on the periodic table at room temperature, along with bromine. But the only metal that is a liquid is mercury. Two metals that are very reactive from the work we've done on the alkali metals, you know, hopefully you've chosen just a couple of those, lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, uh, francium, um, or potentially some of the group two metals. Th um, three metals used in jewellery, so gold, silver, platinum, uh, copper, you could have had as well. Um, and like I say, most, a few transition metals are in there as well. So conium definitely uh, is in there. And four metals used in industry or building. So you've gone for, I mean, where students make a mistake here is they'll say iron and steel. Well, steel's technically an alloy. So we're looking at pure metals, really. So iron, uh, you could have aluminium, copper for piping, um, titanium, and I'm getting there are quite a few others. All right, so moving on then, let's have a look. All right, bit of like year eight revision this is. Okay, so it's about definitions. There are, and if you're watching this later, just pause the video and try and match up in your mind or on paper the four red words, keywords, and their definitions. So we've got native or reduction and reactivity series. And the definitions are a list of elements in order from most to least reactive, removal of oxygen from a compound, unreactive metals found as elements in nature, and a rock containing enough metal to make it economic to extract okay so if you've got let's say if you want to have a go at that now you can do just start like piecing together in your mind all right which red word matches up with which blue box okay i'll give you a couple of minutes to think that through Okay, so hopefully you've uh, had a decent go at that. Let's uh, review uh, the answers. So removal of oxygen from a compound reduction. Now, in the lesson previous to this, we also said, I also taught you that reduction is gaining of electrons. There are actually three definitions of reduction. One is gaining of electrons. One is removal of oxygen from a compound. And the other is addition of hydrogen. Okay, but we're going to come across all three different ones uh, throughout the country course. A list of elements in order from most reactive to least reactive it is the reactivity series of metals, which we'll come on to in a moment. Number three, a rock containing enough metal to make it economic to extract, uh, change the word economic to profitable. Will you make a profit so that extraction is worthwhile? Uh, and four, unreactive metals found as elements in nature uh, native. So things like gold, for example, because of its low reactivity, we can find it as like gold uh, chunks, or we can find it as like gold uh, granules um, when we pan for it as one of the methods for extracting it back in the 1800s uh, Western America. So let's look a bit more then at ores in general. So ores, uh, basically most of the metals will exist in something called ores, which is a rock which contains enough of a metal compound, and that's crucial. An ore is not, does not contain the pure metal. It contains a metal compound which is usually the oxide. So you won't find pure zinc in the ground, but you will find large amounts of rock which contain zinc oxide or zinc carbonate because the zinc would have reacted with the oxygen or carbon dioxide in the air to form those compounds. Um, so here's a few examples. This is um, hematite 
Uh, so this contains iron oxide. So there's iron oxide. That is not magnetic, but pure iron is, all right? So here you've got hematite, which has got iron oxide in it. There you've got pure iron. So you've got iron oxide. What are you gonna have to do to get pure iron? You've got to remove the oxygen. Iron, oxide, remove the oxygen, you're left with pure iron. And you can test that, and we'll have a go at that later uh, with a little practical to, to see uh, the product should be magnetic. Here's some more ores, that's bauxite. So uh, that contains aluminium oxide. Um, like I say, it just looks like a regular rock, but the metal that you get from it is, a, is like most metals, just a nice shiny silvery color. Uh, you've got galena, which is lead ore that contains uh, some lead oxide in it. Again, not pure lead, the actual, uh, and that's uh, copper um, oxide, uh, sorry, copper carbonate in malachite. So that's malachite, it's a beautiful green color. It contains copper carbonate. Um, and that is the same color as things like um, the Statue of Liberty, for example. The Statue of Liberty, uh, when she was built, was made of pure copper. So she was that lovely, orangey, browny, you know, shiny, pure copper when she was first made. But then what happened is she's, uh, all the elements around her, like uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, uh, the pure copper reacted with the oxygen and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, and all the various different acids within, acid re uh, within the rain that uh, came a, a lot more prevalent during the Industrial Revolution and made copper carbonate. So this lovely green color is what is actually coating the actual Statue of Liberty. So if you're taking a bit of sandpaper to her, I don't recommend you do this because you'll get arrested um, by the federal government, um, you'll actually be able to see the pure copper underneath. Okay. But again, she's been oxidized. She's had oxygen, carbon dioxide added to her, which we need to remove, all right, through the process of reduction. Right, quick little activity then. Can we put these metals in order of reactivity? As I've told you in previous videos, you will not get the reactivity series in your exams. You need to learn it. So can we put those in order? I'll give you one minute. Okay, well, if you've learned a, mn a mnemonic to memorize the reactivity series, not all of them are actually in, on this particular activity, but uh, the one that I sort of went through the other, uh, the other day was please stop calling me a cheeky zebra, instead try learning how copper saves gold. And this pattern there as well at the bottom, which is very overreactive. So again, just create your own mnemonic. Um, and, and like I say, that's a fairly easy one to learn. And then like I say, because I, I didn't know that before this year, and uh, I've just recited it a couple of times and it's sort of stuck in my head already, okay? So we've got a reactivity series. So the ones that we'll find in nature will probably be these, well, definitely these ones at the bottom. So silver, gold, platinum, low reactivities. We don't need to extract them from an ore because we find them in their native state. We find them as pure metals uh, in the ground. So we just have to dig for them. Well, that's uh, fairly straightforward. Then you've got anything below carbon is extracted by heating them with carbon. So we could take zinc oxide or iron oxide, tin oxide, lead oxide, or even copper oxide, and heat it with carbon. Just be aware that hydrogen is in the reactivity series with carbon as italics um, because they are not metals, but we can use carbon and we can use hydrogen to extract other metals. So hydrogen is very, very important in the extraction of tungsten from um, tungsten oxide. Uh, and the ones that are above carbon obviously won't work. So if we've got, say, you know, magnesium oxide, we can't heat it with carbon. Carbon does not have the reactivity to displace the magnesium from the magnesium oxide. So what can we do? We have to use something called electrolysis. So that word there, electrolysis, Simply, we've looked at it a little bit before. It simply means we'll break the word down. So we've got electro, 
which means using electricity. Oh, there we go. Electricity. And then we've got lysis, which simply means to split. So splitting apart using electricity. So that's uh, what we need to do for the more reactive compounds. All right? and I'll show you exactly, uh, I'll show you an example of what electrolysis actually looks like now. So if we have a look over here. Okay. So bring you closer to my electrolysis setup. So what we've got here is effectively we've got a power pack, which is just a battery, uh, and we've got it connected up to a lamp, and we've got some copper sulfate solution. Obviously, copper on the reactivity series can be extracted um, by heating it with carbon, um, but the more reactive ones we'll have to melt and heat in, and they've got very, uh, their oxides have got high melting points, and I'll show you the example of aluminium in a moment. So I'm just showing you exactly the principles of electrolysis. So, if I turn on, okay, the power pack, you can see that the current is flowing through the ball and then through these two electrodes, which aren't touching. So you can see now that out of the solution, the light bulb is not on. When I put it back into the solution, the light bulb illuminates. So why is that? Well, at the moment, the circuit is broken. There is a gap between the two electrodes, right? These two graphite electrodes. But when I put it into a solution which contains a metal compound, metal compounds contain ions, so the metal ions are positively charged, they will swim towards the negative electrodes. So these two black rods are called electrodes, uh, and there they'll gain electrons. So again, it's a really good circuit for testing whether something conducts electricity. So the ball has gone off because the air is not conducting electricity, but this is. All right, so this is just copper sulfate solution. And this you could swap for any sort of the most reactive ionic compounds if you just melted them. So if I took sodium oxide, melted it, I would get and put current through it, it would separate into sodium and oxygen. If it was magnesium chloride, melted it, it would separate into magnesium and chlorine. Okay, uh, so this one is actually separated uh, into copper. So, uh, so you can see here, this lovely sort of browny orange color is actually pure copper. Uh, so what's happening is, that, as I just said, is that these two black ones, one's positively charged, one's negatively charged, just like a battery, there's a positive end and a negative end. And because opposite charges attract, the positive copper ions have gone swimming from the solution onto this negatively charged electrode where they have gained electrons, okay? So we'll show another example now with uh, a diagram of the extraction of aluminium. So let's take you back. Right, so uh, extraction of aluminium. Again, we do this in a lot of detail in a later topic, but I thought I might as well introduce it to you now. So again, in this, imagine this is just being a giant beaker. We've got aluminium and we've got oxide ions bonded together. As a solid, the ions cannot move, so you can't pass a current through it. But if I was to heat it up strongly, you can see here the positive aluminium ions. Now, aluminium's in group three of the periodic table, so an aluminium ion, after the atom has lost three electrons, is a three plus ion. And they will go swimming towards the negative electrode where they will gain electrons, okay? So just like I said the other day, they are gaining electrons, so they are being reduced. So the aluminium ions are gaining electrons. If it was sodium ions, they'd be gaining electrons. Any metal ion, if you were to melt a compound containing it and then put a current through it, would deposit at the negative electrode, all right? The problem with the electrolysis is it does use electricity. Well, there's two problems really. Electricity, it uses electricity, which at the moment a lot of electricity is generated through burning fossil fuels. So there is a carbon dioxide cost to the environment. Um, and another thing as well is 
like I said earlier, to melt that compound, you're going to have to use a lot of heat, all right? Which again, whenever you have to heat something up, you have to burn fossil fuels, which is going to, again, cause a massive issue in terms of the carbon dioxide cost. So it's going to contribute to global warming. Okay, so the, that's what electrolysis is, uh, is all about. And that's what you need to do for the most reactive metals. So potassium, sodium, calcium, magnesium, aluminium, you don't heat with carbon. You have to extract through um, electrolysis. Okay, so what about the ones where we can just heat it with carbon? So um, it's just a simple displacement reaction. So here's a classic one here. We've got zinc oxide and we've got carbon and the carbon will take the oxygen away from the zinc oxide to, to produce pure zinc and carbon dioxide. Where students tend to make a, a little mistake here is, is that they say zinc oxide plus carbon makes zinc plus carbon oxide. Well, we're a bit more grown up than that. Say carbon monoxide if you wanted to, right? But call, I think oxide is the one to go for because it is the most stable oxide of carbon. All right, so would this work if I was to swap the zinc for iron? Well, let's look at the reactivity series. Iron is there and carbon is there. So is carbon reactive enough to take away the oxygen, all right, and leave us with pure iron? Well, let's have an example of this. So I've got some little ignition tubes here. All right, first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to light my Bunsen burner. Okay. Beautiful. And then in this little tube, I am going to put, so this is an ignition tube, I'm just going to put some iron oxide, which is this lovely um, orange powder. And like I said earlier, iron oxide is not pure iron. We can prove that with a uh, magnet. So here I've got pure iron. Yep. And what happens? I put a magnet on and it goes up and down the page. It goes up and down because iron is magnetic. Do the same to iron oxide. You can see iron oxide is not pure iron. So it is not magnetic, right? Um, if iron compounds were magnetic, then obviously your blood would be magnetic because it contains a lot of iron ions in it. Okay, so into this tube, I'm going to put some iron oxide. Do it over a sink because I don't want to get it everywhere. Put a little bit more. And one more. Yeah, and I'm just gonna put some carbon with it. So again, I'm hoping that the carbon, due to its increased reactivity, will remove the oxygen from the iron oxide and thus leave me with pure iron, which again, hopefully I'll be able to test with a magnet. So I'm just gonna put some carbon in here, which again is a unmistakable black powder. Okay. So look, perfect. So then put all this to one side. And I'm going to start heating it strongly on a raw flame. Okay. So before I do, I'm just going to give it a little bit of agitating so I can get that really mixed. So it was just two separate powders. Where on, so the orange powder was at the bottom and the black powder's on top. But if I give it a little bit of mixing, I'll be ready to heat. And because it's going to produce carbon dioxide, right, which is a gas, uh, I'm just gonna put a little bit of cotton wool in the end, just to stop, because as the gas escapes, it might carry some of the powder with it. And I don't wanna get hot uh, reactants everywhere, so. Put a little bit of that in there. And then, I think we're good to heat. So, if I put this on a roaring flame, we'll see if anything happens. So, 
if you can't quite see, there's definitely movement going on. The uh, carbon is shooting up. Oop, see how the carbon is going up the uh, tube because of the formation of carbon dioxide. It's a bit like when you open a can of um, fizzy drink that you've shaken up, all right? So um, once the gas will just escape, but carry the liquid with it because it's dissolved in there. So the gas is actually in the middle. It's being formed all over this mixture, including in the middle. So it's trying to escape. Okay. Yeah. You see how it's glowing as well at the bottom. That's a pretty good sign that something's taken place. Okay, okay. So, yeah, you still see it's glowing orange. So, we might have got something. I'll do this for another two, 20, uh, 10 seconds. And then, yeah, that's what I'll do. So we'll turn the gas off. And then if I take out the cotton wool, all right, we'll see whether or not we've got anything magnetic in there. Oh, well, that's sticking to the actual, oh, there's definitely, okay, so, Again, I'm just going to show it to the camera. All right, perhaps with the light background. So as I bring this closer, can you see the black powder jumping up the paper, uh, jumping up the tube, sorry. Yeah. Surefire, yeah, definitely, that's a good one. So you see I've dragged the black powder look up the tube, which means that there is pure iron in it. So remember the orange powder before, okay, was not, Magnetic because it's iron oxide, not pure iron. But I've just then heated the iron oxide with carbon, and the carbon has removed the oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and elemental iron has been left behind. Okay, so that's uh, what you, uh, displacement reactions using carbon. And again, you can do that for anything lower than carbon. You can do it for zinc uh, oxide, iron oxide, tin oxide, lead oxide, copper oxide. Uh, and so on and so forth, All right? And the key thing is, is that the metal oxide is being reduced. So this thing, all right, whatever it is, tin oxide, for example, is being reduced. It's having the oxygen removed. Um, and also, it's gaining electrons. So again, definitions of reduction, either gain, uh, removing of oxygen, gaining of electrons, they're all effectively the same thing. Uh, because the iron ions in this particular one so it was Fe2 plus over here, uh, or Fe3 plus, sorry, is gaining three electrons to make Fe. So again, it is being reduced because reduction is gain of electrons. Whoops. Okay. So again, that's what happened. Just a little bit of a, a brief uh, lesson there uh, into how. Um, the position of the metal in the reactivity series actually dictates um, its method of extraction. So to recap, if it's above carbon in the reactivity series, you have to use electrolysis, heat it really strongly, pass a current through it, uh, and then separate it. High energy cost though. High energy cost means lots of burning of fossil fuels, uh, which means there's an environmental cost as well into the amount of carbon dioxide that's being released. Anything below carbon, all right, zinc, iron, tin, lead, copper, and some others, you can heat them in something called a blast furnace with carbon, all right? And we'll do a little bit more on blast furnaces uh, on Monday. And those that are at the bottom, you can just find native in the ground and just pick them out nice and straightforward, okay? Right, there's one more, there's another way you can actually remove them, all right, which is, I mean, we've got iron oxide there and we're heating it with carbon. Well, technically, couldn't we heat it with aluminium? Aluminium is more reactive than carbon, so it might even be better at removing the oxygen. Well, yes, we can, but the reason why we use carbon is two reasons. All right, one, 
it's very abundant, which means there's quite a lot of it. And two, it's very, very cheap. All right? If we were to use aluminium, uh, then aluminium, which is a, an expensive metal, and the reason why it's expensive is because of, its extra because of its extraction. You have to use electrolysis, which again has a high energy cost. So if it costs a lot of money to get the metal, then the metal itself, to make a profit, has to be more costly, right? which is why it's very expensive. So that's why I use carbon. But you can use aluminium, and that's an example of something uh, called the thermite reaction. So this is the thermite reaction. I've got aluminium plus iron oxide makes aluminium oxide and iron. And it's also got heat in there. Heat is given off. So it's an exothermic reaction. All right, so what I'll try and do is I'll try and demonstrate this reaction here and see if you can actually get a feeling for how much heat is given off. So, okay, first is first, here is my aluminium oxide, uh, sorry, my iron oxide and aluminium mix. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to put it into a paper funnel. Okay, and we'll build it up with sand. Sand has a very, very, very high melting point because it's a macromolecular structure um, of silicon dioxide. So again, I've just put that there. So any, like I say, this reaction, um, it takes a lot of heat to get it going. It's got a very high activation energy. But once it does get going, the amount of heat given off is quite a lot. And the, the iron at the end is not actually solid iron, it's liquid. So you end up with liquid iron, uh, which has a very high melting point. Um, so it'll give you an idea of how hot this reaction is. So I'm gonna put all this in here. Yeah. And then I'm going to just to get, if I heated it with a Bunsen burner, a Bunsen burner probably wouldn't be hot enough to get the reaction going because a Bunsen burner can only go up to blue hot. I need something that's going to be white hot. So I'm going to use a magnesium fuse to get the reaction going. And to give it some encouragement, I'm just going to make a little well in the mixture. And this may or may not work because it's, you know, some of these chemicals are quite uh, a bit old, but we'll try it anyway. So, we get a piece of magnesium. Yes, perfect. Right then, I put all this much right here. So, this is my magnesium fuse. Magnesium gives off a big white light when it reacts. So I'm just going to fold it over, fold it over again, and put it in the middle of my mixture, and then just secure it in place, like so. So then what I'm going to attempt to do is I will light that, I will stand well clear of it, and then we may see a very exothermic reaction. Okay, so. I'll put some burner. So. so it's definitely going. See if it burns out, will we get a reaction? Just to check. Oh. Yeah, it's burning away the edges of the paper. Okay. And that will do so. Right. The actual fuse burnt out before it actually reached the bottom, which does explain quite a lot there. So what I'll do is I will put another one in there. I think maybe it was a bit long last time, so I'll do a shorter one. 
I'll build it up. What I'll also do is, I'm just going to put a bit more activation energy. Give it a bit of a kick. So, see if anything happens this time. Stand well back. And there we go. So, what if I do is if I show you what's been formed, so there's quite a lot of heat given off there, you have to take my word for it, but if you have a look at the mixture afterwards, yeah, you should be able to see okay, a small nugget of molten iron being insulated by the sand around it. So I'll try and get it out so we can have a look. Right. So. Yeah. So See, that's what's left, right? And it's actually still glowing orange uh, in certain places okay so again what i'm going to do is we'll see if i've got any iron left all right i will put this into water and then see if a magnet so you can hear the fizzing from it okay so there's a lump left, and like I say, some of the sand has actually stuck to it, but if the magnet is, oh, come on, we're nearly there. You can see, so there's a lot of sand stuck to which has formed impurities, but hopefully, there's definitely some on top. You can see it's trying to stick to this magnet. Yeah, et voila. So we've actually extracted the iron from iron oxide using aluminium. Uh, used to use this method quite a lot in uh, the olden days to, uh, for railways, right? So to actually get railway uh, joints to actually stick together, used to just melt thermite into it, right? There is another conspiracy theory about this um, reaction as well, uh, linking to the World Trade Center um, disaster 9-11, uh, 2001, um, where everyone, th some people think that the plane, that the um, buildings collapsed because two planes flew into them. Um, but a lot of chemists around, a lot of conspiracy theorists around the world have actually looked at pictures like this and said, well, actually, that's just molten steel. Well, steel is actually, you know, it melts at about 2,000 degrees Celsius. Jet fuel, so the fuel from the plane, right, that's burning when it crashes into the buildings, actually only burns at around 1500 degrees Celsius, actually maybe a bit lower, 1200 degrees Celsius. So a plane on fire is not going to get hot enough to actually melt the steel. But what they do think could have happened is, is because the steel is mostly iron, which will react with oxygen over time to make iron oxide. So we've got iron oxide potentially in all the steel joints uh, of, uh, in the World Trade Center. And the aluminium came from the plane itself, because the aluminium is a very light and very strong metal, which is why we make plane bodies or fuselages out of it. So the plane goes in, all right, uh, the fuel is hot enough to actually get the reaction started, and then it's the thermite reaction, which actually caused the steel girders in the building to melt. Then obviously, as they melt, all right, on one floor, the rest will just fall down, and the weight of those extra floors falling down is what caused the rest of the building to go. Uh, there was a study from uh, Norway University about 10 years ago now who actually found thermite reaction debris all right, in the World Trade Center um, rubble at the bottom. So it's another, just an, a theory which some people have debunked, some people actually still perpetuate. So I'll let you decide on that. And that's basically the extraction 
of metal. So again, use the reactivity series to help you. All I want you to do for this week's lesson is to make one page of notes on what you've seen today 